hard not to want to get out of your head these days with the head shops, alco pops, internet, place your bet, have sex with a girl you've never met, bet on soccer, go to coppers, shots of vodka, Jager bombers, caffeine, salpadine, benzodiazepines, overprescribed antidepressants, marketing to adolescents, billboards, legal highs, drinks industries, advertise, and properly, probably, it's part of our identity. Arthur Guinness, big business, the bloody 12 pubs of Christmas, marketing, staggering, come home for the gathering, buy it, eat it, fuck it, love it, clink it, think it, pop it, sink it, and most of all in Ireland, drink it, and everything will be grand. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now under the influence. Thank you. Thank you. Why I like the title Under the Influence is not just because this series is about the fact that a lot of people are under the influence of alcohol and drugs, but it's also the fact that all of us are under the influence all the time from so many messages, you know, marketing, advertising, sports sponsorship, you know. And it's not just alcohol marketing, but since I started making this series, I'm aware of how often messages about drinking are pushed at you, you know, billboards on the street, ads on the TV, you know, you go to sports events, they're sponsored by alcohol companies, you know. And when you think about, you know, the lack of space that you get, you know, then you think, wow, we are so often under the influence of these strong messages. Now, people always say that, look, it's not the alcohol company's responsibility. You can bring a horse to water, but you can't make him drink it, right? Except if that horse has been walking around and every few meters he is seeing billboards and signs that show better looking horses <laughs> drinking that water. <laughs> and appearing to be having a much better time and overall sense of well-being than that horse has. And everywhere that horse goes, it appears that he's able to buy that alcohol and buy it cheaper, sorry, water. <laughs> Okay, so today we're going to look at what's known as semiotics, the science of signs and symbols, and how it applies to the marketing of alcohol brands. Marketing will always have negative connotations as the sleazy sales guy or the underhanded sales technique, and there is a history of that. I mean, marketing back in the 1950s used to use theories of Freud to understand from a sort of psychiatric perspective and a psychotherapy perspective what consumers were doing. The relationship between the logo and the meaning that you have for them is very often random. So it's almost like a blank canvas that each marketer has. So most of these brands are in fact just empty vessels. And the stories emerge as advertising actually communicates these associations around the brand. Marketing is about influence, it's about persuasion, and it's about tapping into people's needs and people's, if you like, sometimes vulnerabilities. And they offer you intangible things like romance, you know, love, sexual attractiveness. And they say, well, yes, these are intangible things, but with our product, it's a little bit more tangible for you. Like, there's no doubt that guy might not know them girls whatsoever, but they're grabbing his backside or whatever, and, you know, <laughs> he, he, he's more than likely gonna get lucky. Well, at least that's the message it's trying to say to you. So. Usually they're all false connections, but I think when you have something like alcohol, the stakes are higher. So obviously with clothing, if someone feels more confident wearing skinny jeans, fair play to them. But if they feel they can only feel confident and have a great night out by getting absolutely drunk, you know, off their faces, then that's different. So with this particular Guinness ad, do you think that there is a link in general, which is what they seem to be drawing on, between this brand and Irish identity, Irish culture. Yeah, because it's kind of associated there with the sport, like hurling. You'd uh, perceive Guinness to be good then because it's kind of helping the GAA and helping Irish sport in general. Guinness sponsors the hurling, which I think is good that an alcohol company sponsors hurling because <laughs> the players hurl till they drink and the fans drink till they hurl. I think it's the perfect combination. So do you think the more relevant question, you know when people say, what's your poison? Do you think the more relevant question should be, what's your story? Oh, definitely, because that's what makes an iconic brand. It's the story, it's what do people 
say about your brand? Like you saw Guinness, it is intrinsically entrenched in Irish culture, for better or for worse. And that's not something that's going to be erased overnight. And no matter what we say about Guinness, it has done a very good job of connecting itself to Irish culture. The best marketing is the one that doesn't draw your attention to it, that it just inserts itself into the fabric of social life. The GA's position on alcohol sponsorship is that of the 22 main sponsors we have, only one is drink related. Guinness have been with us since the mid-90s. They did huge work for us on the promotion of hurling. It was generally recognised to be very good sponsorship in sport. We work through our, our uh, alcohol and substance abuse prevention programme for the benefit of young people and to educate them on the various addictions that are possible. Should the government change the policy on alcohol sponsorship, we would be delighted to cooperate with that in whatever way possible. Without any doubt, alcohol advertising and marketing does work. I mean, that's one of the reasons why the industry spends uh, 70 to 80 million euros per year on alcohol marketing and advertising. The alcohol industry always says that alcohol marketing works to get people to shift from one brand to another. But I think there's certainly plenty of evidence now that shows that alcohol marketing will encourage people to drink full stop and to drink more than they otherwise would have. Marketing could market it heroin to us and it would look beautiful, but it's easy with drink, isn't it? All you have to do is put a point up. Don't pay the actors, just put a point up and go, go on, have a point. Go on, what are you sitting on the couch for? Go on, you're no crack. <laughs> and if you want a perfect example of the power of semiotics, let's look at Boomers. I moved to Ireland in 1990. I can assure you, Boomers was not associated with the summer. <laughs> Somehow, in the meantime, when people think about Boomers, they think about the summer. But the reason why people think of that is because Boomers sold you that story. And I have to thank Boomers for that. Because we don't actually have a summer. So I think it's Irish people's right to be able to buy a pint of it every now and then. In fact, buy a six pack, have a heat wave, enjoy yourself. <laughs> It's the Guinness series and uh, alcohol sponsored event. Target Market walking by us. And uh, it's Ireland versus Argentina, last match of the Guinness series. There's not too many minutes of a major sporting event that alcohol isn't being sort of promoted to you. So that's why we're here. We're making a series about Ireland's relationship with alcohol. Not, <laughs> no, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to con you into anything, but that is what we're doing. We're doing. So uh, this is the Guinness series. What do you think about uh, how all our, like, a good large portion of our sporting events are sponsored by alcohol? Love it's it. Brilliant. Yeah. Love it. We Absolutely love, alcohol, love so. it. Where are you guys from? Essex. Um, England. Essex. 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 <laughs> so what do you think about Ireland? Ireland is all about Guinness. Guinness beer, best in the world. All about Guinness. That is correct, yeah. Any other reason why you come here? Yeah, Guinness. <laughs> More Guinness. I'm not sure. Oh, let's see what's going on in the match. Oh dear, it's very hard to escape, isn't it? What do you think about Ireland's relationship with alcohol? Yeah, with the relationship with alcohol. Okay. Yeah. Uh, too much alcohol here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a crack. Guinness and burgers. <laughs> An healthy society. Yeah, how do you feel? They talk about banning alcohol sponsorship at sporting events. How do you feel about that? I, I don't think it should happen. People right. should be responsible. You look kids like this. Yeah, you got the need, kids. They, they need what they need, money, at least we put into games, to give kids the opportunity. And banning sponsorship of any type is not a good thing to do. If people can't be responsible in terms of what they do, it's not the answer. But would you not be worried that it kind of normalizes drinking for these guys and drinking costs the state 3.9 billion a year? There is always that danger, but again, it comes back to personal choice and it comes back to responsibility. The problem now is if they get rid of alcohol sponsorship, who else is going to sponsor them? Everybody's worried about the money. Today is the day that like, you, you're going to have a few beers, you're going to have a few pints after a rugby game, have a talk, meet a few boys, have a talk. That's a natural thing in Ireland to do. We know that alcohol marketing does influence young people's behaviour towards drinking. Um, it encourages those who aren't drinking to start drinking and those who are drinking to drink more. This is not just me saying it, there have been massive longitudinal studies involving thousands of children across the globe. Alcohol sponsorship of sports is about a trade-off. It's about sports organisations or teams getting money and in exchange alcohol companies having access to young lucrative male markets in the case of sport. 
It's not a philanthropic exercise. It's not a charity exercise. It allows an alcohol brand to gain positive associations, hero association, with physical prowess, with success. And that's how branding works. It also allows access to markets. That's what they want. You know, one thing I think would be really funny, if alcohol wants to sponsor, like, the I Ireland rugby team, that's fine, but everyone on the team has to have three pints and then go and try to play rugby. <laughs> and you just see how effective what alcohol really does to you. You can't blame a brand or a company for pushing their product or for trying to reach a demographic. That's what they do, you know? And there's this thing of, like, oh, you know, alcohol brands should be responsible and blah, blah. I mean, it says who? Like, they're under absolutely no obligation to act as some kind of greater force in society. And if you're actually handing over responsibility to the companies who are selling the product, then you're in serious trouble. There's a lot of discussion about what's the constructive way to deal with sponsorship of sports events by drinks company. I personally think it should stop. I don't think it should stop maybe today or tomorrow. I think they should be given a chance to get alternative sponsors. Mm. But I do believe we should stop the sponsorship of sports events and concerts um, and all other big events mm. by alcohol companies. It's part of that process of normalising it within our lives, of, of mm. making it a norm, it's an acceptable thing to do, which I think is a mistake. Take, for example, the Heineken Cup. Uh, that now has been burned into the consciousness. In France, you're not allowed to call it the Heineken Cup, it's only the H Cup. I'm not anti-alcohol, but uh, I am anti pushing drugs through professional uh, companies, putting together professional ads that convince young people that the only way to have fun is to get pissed. I'm against that. Best hands to drink with are your own hands. Visit handsaware.ie. When I moved here, people always said things, Americans are very loud, Americans are very obnoxious. In fact, there was this sense that like American was a negative thing. Loud and obnoxious. Now here's the thing. When Irish people get drunk, as far as I can see, <laughs> they get very loud and obnoxious. So I think Drink Aware should have a new campaign which says, if you drink too much, you become American. <laughs> that would put people off. Who funds Drink Aware? Do you have any idea? Who funds Drink Aware? <laughs> That's a really good question. I suppose it's a government body of some sort, is it? The church? I don't know. <laughs> Drinkaware.ie is funded by the drinks industry. Is it really? Yeah. What's, that's kind of like chewing your own foot or something, is it? So it'd be like a drug dealer looking around in pubs going, do you want to buy some drugs? You shouldn't really, it's bad for you, but do you want to have some drugs too? Is it kind of like that? They go, you drink responsible, but you can't. No one can drink responsible. What's that even mean? Like, wear a suit? I don't know what that means. Like. <laughs> How does anyone drink responsible? <laughs> I'm, wearing, I'm wearing glasses, I'm reading a paper, but I'm hammered, you know what I mean? It's just, it can't happen. It affects how you act. It, it, it can't be done. This is drinkaware.ie. To be honest, most of the messages are actually about drinking. Pacing your drinking. Know your drinking, you know? In fact, I would argue that a lot of their campaigns really say absolutely nothing. I think a more honest name would be drinkaway.ie because it seems to be basically they just want you to drink and just, you know, not harm yourself, which is fine, but drinkaway.ie to me is a harm reduction site and is not, uh, it's not a complete response to the harm that alcohol provides. You know, I think a, a, a product with as much power as alcohol uh, needs a bit more response from the people who produce and distribute it than drinkaware.ie. Let's look at drinkaware's campaigns. Know the one that's one too many. What does that say? <laughs> know the one that's one too many? We're in Ireland. I'll give you a hint. It was two hours ago. <laughs> oh, hi, can I speak to Ronan, please? It's Des Bishop. Can you get to call you back? Yeah, um, can I leave my phone number for you, please? Thanks very much. Thank you. See you. Bye. 
It's Des Bishop here? Okay, just, just make sure he knows it's in relation to a documentary we're making about Ireland's relationship with alcohol. Pretty much everybody from the drinks industry won't talk to us, like won't do an interview with us. Uh, Mick, how you doing? It's Des Bishop here. Get back to me as soon as you can, and I appreciate the effort. We have some strong opinions about their product, and I think, you know, I just want to try to encourage them that it's good for them to talk to us, you know? I'm going to try to get through to the CEO of Mass, uh, Mature Enjoyment of Alcohol and Society, and uh, they run the drinkaware.ie website. Uh, this is Des Bishop here. We actually had an interview scheduled with Fanula, and then it was pulled. So I just wanted to uh, kind of find out why and possibly try to reschedule it. Dude, tell her I'm dying to talk to her. Thanks, thanks a lot. Bye. Did I sound sarcastic there? <laughs> I actually wanted to talk to Drink Aware because I figured, like, this series is about rethinking our drinking. <laughs> it's one of their slogans. And uh, I thought they would be happy to talk to us because we're sort of on the same page. But actually, they were going to talk to us. And then at the last minute, they pulled out, despite the fact that we are promoting the same message, which is, you know, don't let alcohol ruin you and don't let alcohol ruin our society, which it has the potential to do. I would have liked to have talked to them. A lot of people make an argument that availability is one of the reasons why people are drinking more, because it's more available than ever. You can't get fucking petrol without seeing the big drinks promotion in your face, which I always think is amazing. Just when we finally cut down drink driving in this country, we sort of tempt people to go back to it. <laughs> it's like, oh, you're getting petrol in your car? Here's fucking 12 cans of some brand you've never heard of for 10 euro. <laughs> No one even knows what to drink it anymore. You go to some of the party a few years ago, what are you drinking? They would have known what they were drinking. They would have gone Heineken or Budweiser. It was kind of limited. If you go to a barbecue now and you say to someone, what's that? They'd be going, oh, uh, uh, having a clue. 77 cans for three quid. <laughs> it's all about price though. People don't care. I've got mates that drink, whatever that's called. Some Polish beer, man. No one knows what it's called. It's like 9% and it's four quid for like fucking a keg of it. Like. It is more available now, but you can buy it anywhere. You can get alcohol anywhere, so like, yeah. Uh, that would be 649 and 28 cents. Oh, sorry, I forgot one thing. Okay. For the morning after. Oh, I, I can actually only sell you one pack of these now. Oh, you can only sell one pack yeah, of paracetamol? One. Yeah. All right, just the one. Okay. And all that stuff. All right. I think selling alcohol in large quantities in supermarkets is not a good idea. If you look around now, that you'll notice there are far more outlets selling alcohol. All the supermarkets and the smaller shops, petrol stations, alcohol is too cheap, it's too inexpensive. Alcohol has never been less expensive in this country. They give out about the price of drink in Tesco, it's like young people are just buying too much drink in Tesco. I think young people are drinking too much, but here's the truth. If they weren't buying it for cheap in Tesco, they'd be fucking idiots. <laughs> Our young people might drink too much, but they're not fucking stupid, thank God. <laughs> We're drinking about twice as much as our antecedents did 50 years ago, and about 50% as much as they did 25 years ago. It has become part of the way in which we live, and I think we should step back from that. I think opening a bottle of wine every night or every second night is a bad idea. Irish people were never meant to discover wine <laughs> because it has too much social acceptability for a race of people so prone to problem drinking. So now we have a whole generation of people drinking huge amounts of wine under the impression that they're not actually drinking. <laughs> I have loads of friends that can't have a slice of bread without thinking, do you know what I'm gonna love them with that slice of bread? <laughs> a glass of white. Buttering a bit of toast. Do you know what'll go lovely with that bit of toast now? A glass of red. Do you know what'll go lovely with a glass of red? A sarpedine. It'd be lovely. <laughs> People that drink wine will like to tell you, this is like, mm, I bought, it's French, is it French? Yeah, French, yeah, 1946, um, Bordeaux. People like to think wine is more sophisticated, you know, but it's the same stuff, like, it usually ends with someone crying. Do you know what I mean? They pick a bottle of it, like, you know what I mean? They go, mm, I'm just gonna have one glass, and then like two bottles later, they're on the ground, listening to ABBA. Most people, I think, underestimate the amount of alcohol in a bottle of wine. Most bottles of wine have eight to 10 or 11 units of 
alcohol. Mm. And many people think it's got four glasses, four units. So there's a lot of mismeasurement like that, I think, about the amount of alcohol people are taking. I've loads of friends that have people over for dinner on a Tuesday. I was like, yo, you got to take it easy on the one. Like, what do you mean take it easy on the one? I have wine with my dinner. The French have wine with their dinner. They're not alcoholics. Like, again, yeah, the French have a glass of wine with their dinner, not a bottle each because it's on special in Tesco. Irish people haven't performed well at running banks or drinking alcohol. I think there's a real opportunity for the government to have a short-term health gain in the time of this government by increasing substantially the price of alcohol, um, eliminating cheap alcohol and reducing the availability of alcohol. Kerry County Council wants to allow people in rural areas to drive even if they're over the alcohol limit. The council passed a motion put forward by the independent councillor Danny Healy Ray calling for a permit system for those who live in isolated parts of the country. I'm not asking to break the law. What I'm asking is that a different law be uh, implemented to cater for uh, these, these uh, kind of people. All these months making this documentary, you think maybe people in Ireland really want to take some action. And then we see the type of campaign that they're leading down in Kerry. Not everyone has the same campaign in mind when it comes to uh, challenging Irish drinking habits. Tackling the Irish drinking problem, Kerry style. Beat depression with depressants. I took a decision from an early stage that I wasn't going to meet with the drinks industry at all because I don't believe that they're part of the solution. Actually, their aim, and it's a legitimate aim for any industry, is to sell more alcohol, whereas my aim as minister was to reduce the amount of alcohol that people consume. Um, I would have to say, though, that other ministers meet on a regular basis with the industry, and sometimes the kind of comments that other ministers make or their submissions to our proposals, uh, you know, that the language is very much the language mm -hmm. of the alcohol industry. There's a lot of vested interests in maintaining us drinking large amounts, and we need to tackle this on a whole lot of different fronts. But do you think so that, like, large portions of our society, including power in our society, is almost sort of subconsciously bought by the financial power of the drinks industry. Yeah, I have no doubt about that. That is the case. They're, the alcohol industry is very, very influential. And, uh, you know, it has ways of winding its way in and uh, getting influence in lots of different kind of places. We're at the Department of Health. We're here to talk to Alex White. And we just want to see what the government's going to do about the problem. They commissioned a steering committee report on substance misuse. It's been out nearly a year and it seems to be on the way to being implemented under Roisin Shorthall. And now, uh, nearly a year later, we're talking to Alex White, the man responsible for implementing it now, to see whether it'll come. How are you? I put it to you that possibly the government are waiting for a time where it's less of an issue so they can just push this down on the long finger. Conspiracies usually don't exist. This is a democracy and we do actually have to consult with people when we make decisions. You know, we can have fantastic ideas, but we have to make them work as well. So they have to be practically capable of implementation. We've held lots of reports, right? My job is not so much to talk about reports. My job is to show the, you and to show the people that we can act on these reports. And that's what we're going to do. We are going to bring in legislation. We're working at the moment on what that legislation might look like if and when we get agreement to proceed with it. We know the kind of things that we want to do in relation to minimum pricing, in relation to separation, structural separation in, in, in shops, and in relation to marketing and advertising. We've got our priorities do in here. Do you know, the by the way, in relation, to marketing and advertising, in relation to marketing and advertising, is there a, a general consensus? Do you, do you feel that it's going to be easy to push across those recommendations? Nothing in here, nothing in this business is easy. Right. It, it, nobody ever said it was going to be easy. We're working through. We've got other government colleagues that we're talking to about these issues. We've got other, you know, uh, uh, we've got some more work to do on, on the issue of sponsorship and advertising and marketing. There's no doubt about that. And that's why we need this period in order to do it. But we will, the, 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 the thing is, we, what people need to understand is that, you know, this work is actually happening and will bear fruit. There will be legislation. There's one thing I've learned recently is that the brand is just a story, a story that they write and they sell to you. And people talk about Brand Ireland. And, you know, part of Ireland's story is a story that we pass on to each other. And some of it has too much booze in it, which has been fine, but it's got to a stage where 
something needs to change. And these people in here, they have the power to write a new chapter in that story. Roshan Shortle tried to write a chapter, now we have Alex White. It's up to him to write that chapter. He says he's gonna, I hope he does. Because if he doesn't, as far as I'm concerned, that place in there is the drinks cabinet. <laughs>